Hello, everybody. We are just waiting for people to join. So um, talk amongst yourselves for a moment, and we will as well. Um, I'll just say hello to uh, Jenny and Eve. Um, where are you both? Um, I'm in the middle of London, looking over my garden, which is starting to become interesting. Oh, lovely. Lovely. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in North London, just near Hampstead Heath at the top of Kentish Town in my studio. Oh, Fantastic. And you've got a, a lovely piece of um, art behind you, Jenny. Yeah, unfortunately, I've had a few complaints that people haven't been able to see the art behind me. So I'm just going to give you a little look there. So actually, it's a oh. fantastic artist. Um, and she uh, painted some of our things, our, our clothes, a little while ago. But there they are. Amazing. <laughs> well, I... The, I... The, the laptop any higher, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I think we'll start, um, if that's okay with everybody. So I would like to say a warm welcome and thank you for joining us, everybody, today. Welcome to our guest, Jenny Packham, and of course, our Vice Chair, Eve Pollard, who will be asking the questions. Thank you both ladies for, for joining us today. Many of us have seen Jenny's beautiful dresses gracing the red carpets all over the world worn by iconic and talented women, Kate Winslet, Angelina Jolie, Taylor Swift, to name just three. Um, she's also very well known for her beautiful bridal gowns. Each design can take hundreds of hours to make and they feature delicate and very detailed embroidery. I, I must say I'm very jealous. I would love one in my wardrobe. Jenny knew from an early age that she was going to be involved in the fashion industry, and I'm delighted that we've been able to catch up um, with her today to tell us about her fantastic career, her life, and how she and the business have coped during lockdown. It's all captured um, in her new book, of which I have a copy here. Um, so if you haven't got a copy, please go on to our um, website or in the chat section here and you will be able to buy a copy, um, which is fantastic. And 25% of, uh, of, of this comes to Wellbeing of Women as well. So that's also um, great. Um, uh, I know that you're itching to hear Jenny, but before we start, I just wanted to tell you um, a little bit about Wellbeing of Women and to everybody who's made a donation, thank you so much. We raise vital funds to improve all aspects of women's health by investing in research. We train the next generation of researchers, doctors, midwives, and scientists. Now, women make up 51% of the population, but our influence over the health behaviors of our families, our friends, and the wider community is much greater. So it's important that we have the best information when it comes to making choices about our health. So much of women's health remains shrouded in secrecy, whether it's period problems, the menopause, well-being issues, fertility, or in pregnancy like miscarriage, which affects one in four couples. Women's cancers are another area that we must talk about more and not be shy and embarrassed. If we know the symptoms, then we can go and talk to our doctors and start to get help. So I am asking all of you to please help us break these taboos, raise awareness, and absolutely please help us raise funds for our research. You can sign up to our newsletter, attend more of our events, and take part in one of our fundraising activities. Your donation will help us find the next breakthrough that will help the women and girls in your life. Just before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. Please, please, if you want to ask a question, do so in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will put some of these to Jenny at the end. So um, it's over to um, Jenny and to Eve. The floor is yours, or the red carpet is yours, maybe. Thank you, Janet. Um, well, good afternoon. I don't know whether we're on, but I think we probably are on, and we're going to start this chat. And let me introduce you to Jenny Packham very beautiful, very clever, and has written a really brilliant book. And I'll hold that up at the end because not only is it brilliant, it's a rather beautiful looking book, but that wouldn't surprise you because she makes rather beautiful clothes. Um, Jenny, let's start at the beginning. 
how did you know you were going to do this? What, what, how early did you feel, I want to be involved with fashion, I want to be involved with clothes? Uh, well, both of, my, um, both of my grandmothers were needlewomen. One of them was the dressmaker for the local community. The other one actually went back to college in her 50s to do embroidery at Southampton Art College. Um, and they were always, both of them, always making stuff, um, either for, for me or, you know, they, my, my other grandma was knitting all the time. So I think, and my mum would make her own clothes too. So I think I just sort of grew up in this very sort of creative um, sort of environment where I just sort of thought that's what you do. You make your own clothes, you know, especially if you want something really special. So I think at about 11, I'd sort of started making my own clothes. And then I discovered that there was a job called a fashion designer. Um, I saw it in a careers book. And <laughs> thought, that sounds that sounds perfect. And I, I suppose I'm, I probably think, you know, I didn't really look around much for different jobs, <laughs> spe specs, but um, I feel quite fortunate that, you know, I decided that then. And I, I really did start sketching that night. And I've, I've never really thought about being anything else. Um, so, and the job that I do, and I think the way that I design, it also means I'm designing the fabric, so it brings in a sort of textile side. So I've been very lucky in having my own company for so many years to be able to experiment, not just with just designing dresses. I think if I just, I, you know, I love running the business, but also um, just experimenting with, you know, different ways to, to make the dresses, I suppose. Great. Well, so you were young, and later on we might talk about you and your mum going shopping, but... Your designs are dreamy. I mean, they are, you know, the evening dresses are covered with beautiful little palettes and lovely sequins, and then a bit of skin was, be, you know, allowed to show through mesh and beautiful things. You decided early to be at that end of the fashion market, or that was the end that fascinated you? Um, I, don't, I don't think I thought about it too much. I went, when I... Um... When I left school, I went straight to Southampton Art College where I did a day tech course for two years, which was a, a, a really good course. It was very practical and I learned how to make patterns and actually sew properly. Um, so it was a good, a good course to have before I went to St. Martin's, which was, you know, suddenly it was just all about creativity rather than the, the practical side of it. But I think, you know, as a designer, you need, you need to know those things. Um, but I very quickly went into special occasion or more kind of uh, sort of, you know, something with a lot more embellishment. I, I think I always wanted to make a statement with my work and I wanted it to be noticed. And I think in a way that that sort of, it wasn't cool at St. Martin's to be an evening wear designer. Mm -hmm. And I certainly never mentioned bridal because that would not be cool at all. But I think being niche is, is one of the things that has really helped us as a business to, you know, to um, survive for so long. And of course, it's been a family business for 33 years. I couldn't believe that you've been going. Yeah, I can't believe it either. I don't even like saying it. It just makes me really <laughs> and, cool. and you and your husband have been running or yeah, started. I met Matthew, he was a sculpture student at Central and I was at St. Martin's. Um, and then after he left college, he started up an art direction company and he was doing videos, pop videos. So uh, he asked me actually to do, I just sort of finished college as well. Um, and he asked me to make some costumes and then we started going out with each other. And very quickly, we, um, we got ourselves a studio under the Westway in Portobello. Um, we didn't know what we were gonna do. We just wanted to be creative. Um, and then I remember one day just sort of saying, oh, why don't we, why don't we start a fashion, a fashion company? <laughs> and we just sort of thought, okay. And then, you know, we, we got on with it really. But now Matthew, um, sort of over the years, I think what happens is when you work with your partner, you gradually take on, um, you know, different roles yeah. to make sure that each other have sort of space to do, um, you know, just to have some autonomy over certain areas of the business. So Matthew has obviously always been the sort of financial side and sort of runs the, um, runs the business. Um, and yet, you know, it, it's, it's lovely being able to sort of discuss it all together, I suppose. Yes. Now, what I loved about your book is you go into the detail so interestingly. I mean, you talk about finding a, um, a sequin or finding a, a jewelry thing that you're going to put on a dress. I, sorry about the jewelry thing. You'll probably describe it more accurately. And from that comes the whole vision of the dress. That's how 
your brain works. I explain that to us, because I think it's rather interesting. Well, at the beginning of the book, um, I talk about, the, the, just to explain the book, the book is very, um, broken down into the chapters, and each chapter is almost like a, a, a sort of a, a process in making a dress. So we start off with inspiration, then we go on to sketch, fabric, shape. Um, and then in each chapter, I've sort of talked about the, you know, how, you know, the, the creative mind works to, to sort of build a dress, but also, you know, I suppose more the sort of emotional side and bits of sort of anecdotes. So the first chapter is inspiration. Um, and hopefully what I do is I sort of describe the enormous sort of um, difference in ways that you can get inspiration. You know, there's the obvious ways of going to an exhibition and sort of seeing something amazing and getting inspired. Um, actually, jewelry is a wonderful way of, um, I think the pieces that I was spoke, you know, talking about, you know, sometimes you look at a piece of jewelry and it's just, it's almost like there's a dress just there ready, you know, and you just have to sort of superimpose it and add the fabric. Um, and then sometimes the inspiration comes from places that, you know, you don't, there aren't such sort of good sort of storylines. I mean, I, one of the things I discussed was I, I actually had a designer that worked with me who kept on saying that she was um, allergic to moths. She hated moths. And um, one day we opened a box from, I think, either India or China. And this, this moth, great big, beautiful moth actually flew out. And she just completely washed out. And I realized it was a very serious, you know, alert, uh, reaction to a moth, a phobia, I suppose. Um, and then she left not long after um, because she uh, went off to live in Japan for a while before she came back. And my new designer brought in this lovely book of um, moths. And I sort of, it was my way of sort of getting over losing her because I was so upset about it. And I did a whole collection on the, the wings of moths, which are absolutely beautiful. So, you know, there's, there's such different ways that it comes to you. But I think, um, and also I talk about the very mundane ways, you know, standing at a bus stop or, you know, being in the New York Customs Hall and being very bored, actually. I hate waiting for buses or waiting for anything. Um, and then I sort of entertain myself by thinking, okay, what can you see that you could make a dress out of? You know, whether it's, the, you know, someone, something else someone's wearing or, you know, something in the shop window or just, just anything. So hopefully I answered that question. Because that's- did, did, you, know, you did, I mean, that's what's interesting. And the other thing is also you're very clued up on history, history of clothes. I mean, we had an interesting time the other day, didn't we, talking about bridal. Yeah. Uh, clothes and the veil um, and that I thought was because can we talk about the grey wedding dress that you chose? Okay well, let's talk about bridals. <laughs> well, I, I think it's very difficult to design, sorry excuse me, to design bridal wear without knowing about the history because first of all um, the history of bridal really documents you know women's evolution through time um, and there's so many traditions in, in bridal wear that to sort of not know about that when you're designing, because when someone, when you design a wedding dress that someone buys, my feeling is that they have to fall in love with it. They have to, there's something about that dress that they have to form an attachment with. It has to feel like their dress. Um, and I think the more you know about bridal wear, um, and I also talk about a visit to the VNA archive. Um, I went in, I saw about six dresses and they were all laid when I went in, they were all laid on these tables, um, covered in tissue with these dresses laid. And for a minute, they looked like bodies, actually. So it felt like an autopsy room or something. And from that, I kind of really realized that, you know, this was in a way what was left of these women, you know, um, and how these dresses have lasted so much longer than them and the importance that we put on the wedding dress. And therefore to actually design for, women who are you know, getting married and becoming part of their history is actually very special to me. And we get so much sort of feedback from girls. And when I meet a girl, she says, oh, I wore your dress, Eden, or, you know, they, they tell me the names. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's lovely. You know, you, you've had some, you've played some part in, in somebody's life. My own dress was definitely the, the most difficult dress I've ever <laughs> designed. I don't design for myself at all. Uh, that would be very limiting. Um, as I talk in the book, I, I mostly wear dark colours and I think that I love to sort of project my creativity onto other people. Um, and my job is to create fantasy and escapism through those clothes. So 
when I had to sort of turn that around and think about, also I was 50 years old um, and I didn't feel rightly or wrongly that I could wear one of my big white dresses with a train and everything. So what I did was I, I chose to design and make something that was sort of um, more sort of connecting to me as a designer. So I, first of all, I ordered this beautiful lace from Austria. It was much more expensive than I would ever be able to afford to put into the collection. Um, it was a Kipur lace. Um, and uh, we, we made the dress with no seam. So we interlocked all the lace, which was all sewn by hand and sort of shaped it around. And it was a real treat as I, I felt for, you know, any of our brides to have a dress made, um, you know, completely for you. I, I really sort of felt the sort of indulgence in that. So, and also the dove blue color, you know, was, is uh, like I said, I wear a lot of black. So for me, it was like, oh, I've got, I can't wear black. So what color am I going to wear? And uh, I loved it. I mean, covered it in the sort of speckly, um, crystals and then obviously the, I had a very small little veil um, but I think the thing that you mentioned about the veil which is a wonderful um, history sort of uh, of, of bridal wear is the reason we wear the veil if you look back is that you know with the arranged marriages sadly sometimes the bride would turn up and be quite shocked at who she was going to marry because sometimes they wouldn't actually know who it was or, or meet them before the wedding and the veil was actually a way of covering up their, you know, their tears or their you know, the look of horror, maybe. Um, and um, it's quite strange when I'm in the, you know, when I'm in the bridal shop sometimes and we have that last fitting and the girls, you know, got her dress on and we just maybe pull the veil over. And I have to say nine times out of 10, she bursts out crying. And I always think, you know, I know it's a moment, but maybe there's some sort of, you know, past, passed down trauma <laughs> coming out at that point. Well, also you were your father's to give away, you know, there were dowries, there was, it was all very complicated. It's quite sad, really. Mm. It's, thank heavens, it's not like that in this country in the West now, but, mm -hmm. and you wore, I mean, a little thing because you also felt a bit shy. Yeah, I'm not very, you know, I'm not very sort of, uh, that's one of the things actually for me getting married was, you know, people kind of looking at you for the day. But um, I felt that even that tiny little bit of um, veil across my face just gave me a slight sort of- uh, Protection. Tiny bit of distance and protection. Yeah, but it was a beautiful day, wonderful. Let's go on to black because so many of us, I mean, we'll talk in a minute about how you look in your closet, which I found the book is very revealing about you. Looking in the closet was horrifically revealing about me like being in Wales, looking down a coal hole, there was so much black. But let's talk about black, because let's face it, we all wear a lot of it. And you look, you're talking quite rightly about looking a jacket, being ready for work and all the rest of it. And, and you, you talk about black in an interesting way, because it's not a bad thing, another black thing. You just think, well, this is, this makes me look businesslike. Yeah, I think it's, um, it was interesting writing that chapter because in a way I explored why I've always worn black. Uh, I mean, obviously I grew up, I was a sort of teenager, young person in the eighties and, you know, obviously it was very fashionable to wear black. Um, but I think it's something to me very sort of, um, I feel very safe in black. I feel very, um, I think it's a classless color. Uh, is that, it's actually the most worn color by, um, British people, actually. Um, and I think, you know, at that point when you're young, it's also a colour that's used by young people to be, to upset their parents. And it certainly upset my mum a lot, you know, it was sort of constantly, why do you wear so much black? And in the end, she said to me, oh, I think you wear black because you just don't want to be noticed, you know. And it was like, no, that's not the truth. That's not the truth. I wear it because it's really cool. I feel really flattered by it. Um, and also black's not just black, you know, you can wear, you know, different textures of black and shapes and, and I think especially for a student it's a very good colour to have because, you know, it's easy to look after and stain proof. <laughs> Whereas, and then I just, I suppose it was a habit that I just, you know, carried on wearing black. My, I have to admit my wardrobe now is, is, is much more colourful. But I'm, I use it with black, I, I think. I'm happy to wear colour if there's a sort of a, a darkness with it. But, and as I got older, definitely I use a lot, I wear a lot more navy now as well. It's slightly more sort of softer on our skin yes. tones. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, I talked about sort of, um, you know, the early films I watched where, you know, Count Dracula would always be sort of walking around with that great big cape on. And all this stuff obviously must have sort of, it's a very powerful color and it's empowering to wear it. And I think in, a, in the world I've grown up with, I, I think it's always made me feel smart, like you say, and ready for anything, you know, whatever happened. Wonder Woman. Well, you've made me feel better about wearing black. So that's, that's good. <laughs> um, and then what is interesting is you talk about color. I mean, you lose a lot of pictures of Her Majesty the Queen in color. And you talk about brightening other people's day and what color does. So talk a bit about that, because as we just discussed black, yeah, it'd be nice to go on to that. I think it is, it is a way, um, you know, color can be used. Um, I, I talk about the way that the queen wears color. So she wears it in a very sort of benign way. She wears it to be seen and to be remembered. And I think a lot of important people, you know, even people we dress for the red carpet, you know, the first thing that they talk about is what color they want. And I think for us, when we go into our wardrobes in the morning, you know, the first, you know, that, that sort of reaction to the colors that we can wear says so much about our mood. And I, I think if you go for a job interview or whatever you're doing, um, you know, think about the color of, you know, of your lipstick, of your shirt, because you can leave, you know, like maybe don't do it quite so sort of top to, top to bottom like the queen does. Um, and with the Queen, I, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, I, I went, actually went to a um, function, at a tea, one of the tea parties at um, Buckingham Palace. And, you know, I have to sort of really admit, did I see the Queen or did I just see, you know, the passing That's the colour? In mm. colour. But the main thing is that everyone goes home and says they've seen the Queen and then she's achieved, you know, and remember, you know, remembers her for that. So I think you can do the same way in your life, you know, if you want to make a little bit of an impact, you know, choose your colors, you know, and I really admire people when I, when I see them walking down the road wearing color well, because it isn't easy. It's something you have to experiment and work with. But um, I think it's a quite, a, it's a giving thing. You're really, you know, giving to the people around you, you know, wearing, I wonder when we come out of this, you know, this situation that we're in, maybe we'll all feel a little bit more you know, inspired to wear colour and be a bit more giving and joyful with how we present ourselves rather than after we've burnt our lounge pants. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, and then let's talk about, well, we'll talk in a minute. You do design things for the Duchess of Cambridge. Beautiful, beautiful. And I know we can't talk about it a lot, but um, is there a special, I mean, obviously a great delight in designing for someone so beautiful and someone who's doing such a great job. But um, are there things that sort of were you frightened at first when you were asked to do it? I know you dress some of the foreign royals. Um, is there anything you can tell us about that job? I mean, do you have to plan months in ahead because they plan months in ahead? Is it, is it complex or is it just as lovely as making a dress for anybody else? Um. I can't tell you about it. <laughs> um, I think dressing, um, you know, we know, when we do our sort of celebrity dressing, um, yeah. you know, sometimes you've got a very short amount of time, a ridiculously short amount of time. I mean, we talk in the book about Kate Winslet and making her a dress in four days for the, yes. the Titanic 3D premiere. Um, yeah. That was wonderful because we got to work with her sort of, you know, more or less every day for those days to do the fitting. And, and, and I loved that challenge of, actually having to get it right you know I mean usually when we work with the celebrities they've usually got three or four other dresses in the pipeline as well their stylists will be sort of making sure that they've got choice and that's why it is actually such a privilege actually when you do dress someone um, I think it's um, I think the longer we have and the more knowledge we have of the um, event that someone's wearing something to um, but you know it's fashion everything happens at the last minute you know so I, I think it's, um, it, like I say, it's always wonderful if I can meet the person, but sometimes it's done through stylists. Sometimes I wake up and they've worn something over the other side of the world and I didn't even know it was going on, you know? So it's great, but I, as I've got older and more experienced, um, really, you know, when you, you make a couture per piece for someone, it brings in all your experience and therefore, you know, you can do a really good job. And I, I enjoy that very much. It's a very wonderful description of making her dress because I think even at the very end, I think her hand appears at the at the car door and you'd see a bit of the arm and you know 
your dress is the one she's well, chosen. Even though we've been working with her nonstop for three days making this dress, you never quite know because also we all we all know, don't we, that when we we plan something for the evening, it's hanging there, everything's going to plan, and then we put it on, and for some reason we've just gone off it, and then we pull something else out of the wardrobe. So you never you never really know whether they're going to wear it, and that's you know they will wear what they feel best in, and that's it. And what are, you had other highlights? Like Sandra Bullock wore, wore a wonderful dress. Yeah, she was our first A-lister. Um, so, um, and that was a surprise. We didn't know she was going to wear that. Um, so that was that was wonderful. And that was from the first collection that we'd taken to New York. We, we showed in the UK for a very long time. And then we decided that we needed to sell to the American stores and we wanted to dress more celebrities. So we thought, well, we've, we've shown here for you know a long time. Let's go and let's go and show in New York. So that collection for us was, um, and it was very quintessentially English. It was sort of based on a Cecil Beaton fantasy uh, tea, tea party, garden party. Um, and actually we ended up, the whole fashion show ended up on Gossip Girl as well. So it was a good move for us. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. I mean, I think that the idea that your, your style's going around the world and do, they, do occasionally you get A-lists and say, I love that dress, but can we have it? A bit lower, a bit higher. Do you make it for them? And I love the way you describe the seams have no 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 give. I mean, you've got to be that thin on the night. Yeah, I think um, you know it, it's better if we can do the alterations. Um, but often what happens is you know they have amazing people out in LA that do alterations. But it's always quite a shock when you suddenly see them wearing it and they've altered something and they haven't mentioned what they're doing. <laughs> and it's just like. Oh, they took the sleeves off. <laughs> you know? and but, um, they do, which they do do sometimes, you know, because again, they're working once they've got the dress um, on the, you know, on the star, and they're all stood there and they say, "Oh, let's do this," and they haven't got time to send it back. So they, that sort of thing does happen, um, and they're always shortening things and taking them in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's all just, you know, and and yes, they all want it as tight as possible. <laughs> so we've had have you had dips as well over the years? Oh yes. Mm. Have you had a difficult time because things like the Oscars, things like you know the BAFTAs, all those things have they are still on TV, but it's not quite the same, is it? I mean, is that proved difficult, or are people ordering online and stuff? Um, I think I think it's it's evolving. I mean, this is I, I think they're going ahead at the moment, and obviously you're seeing some you know some people making little videos and. Some people will just be on Zoom. Some people are sort of setting up. Uh, some of them must be going to the red carpet because they, they, they appear to be there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's all a bit of a shame. It's not what anybody wants, but there's still, I think the, the, the funny thing is it's still a desire to dress up and there's still a desire for us to sort of see people sort of, you know, presenting themselves in such amazing things. So um, I don't know, I think, you know, this whole Zoom thing has changed you know, you've got to think more about the neckline, put all your detail all up here. Yes. Um, you know, this is what it's all about now. So I, I think for some people that we've been sort of putting things together for, um, you know, you're, you're, you're having to sort of think about and ask where they're actually going to be wearing it and how it's going to look. But yeah. I really hope it can all get back to normal soon. Yeah, definitely. And have you got a lot of brides who've been waiting and are ready, ready for the off when they yeah, can? Yeah, I mean, it seems to be changing daily at the moment. Yeah is um, a bit of a shock I think but we've we I think we're going to see two things we've got this year where you're going to have a lot of obviously nearly all the weddings for last year were cancelled I um, mean we're still holding dresses for girls who were getting married last year so this year I you know we're probably going to see um, a lot more sort of quick turnarounds of dresses um, and we are working on some off the you know off the peg type dresses so that people can just sort of have them and go because they want to do it quickly and then you've got people planning for next year. Apparently next year is complete, all the, you know, the, um, the places people get married are all completely booked up. Oh, really? Um, yeah, so I think everyone is expecting a sort of boom in the bridal and we, we need it really, because not just dresses, but, you know, people that do flowers and, you know, events and, and the whole industry has had to ground, grind to a halt really. Yes, so that would be good if it gets better. Now, we also talked about memories, like we were talking about Diana wearing her wedding dress. And I said, I'm so old, I, I appeared in that BBC thing talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, 
But it was amazing when she got out of the carriage and there was, I was at the BBC and there was a, a noise that said unmade bed. And then <laughs> David Emmanuel pulled it down. Didn't he? Yeah. Well, that's right. I, I was actually, um, I was going through my real sort of grumpy teenage years at the time. Huh. And I didn't want anything to do with it. And my mum pulled me downstairs and said, you've got to watch this. This is a historic moment. And um, so I remember sitting on the sofa with my arms folded, you know, really sort of a bit put out because I was doing something. And then out she stepped and I, I just thought, despite what, you know, people always sort of talk about that dress, you know, in a sort of derogative way, but I actually, my heart melted. I just thought, wow, that's amazing. Because at that point, everything in that 80s had got to extremes, you know, shoulders and sleeves, everything, you know. And I think to me that moment was, it was like the, the, the pinnacle of that fashion trend. And after that, it probably sort of fizzled away. And I think when she sort of stepped into the church, you know, there was something about Diana. She was just full of wonderment of, you know, what was happening to her. And I just loved it. And I think when they, I, I actually think the opposite of, you know, when it all came out, it's taffeta. So that's what it does, you know, it, it crunches, but it smooths out beautifully. You know, it's an amazing fabric. and. It was almost like she got out like this sort of crumpled flower and then just sort of blossomed as they kind of pulled it all out around her. So yeah, I think it was quite a wonderful moment. Yes, it's a wonderful moment, I agree. And what about you you have muses? That's the other thing I think really interesting about your design. So tell us you tell us first about Marilyn Monroe, because you somehow latched on her as an interesting muse. Tell tell us how yeah, you found was, how you kept it going. Wonderful season for me, actually. I really enjoyed that season. Um, so I don't actually, I don't often have muses, but I just, um, I was in Paris and I was buying a drink from a newsstand and I saw these postcards of her and I just looked at her. It was like it was, I looked at her for the first time and I thought, why are you still here? You know, why, why are you still everywhere? You know, you, you died 60 odd years ago and yet you're actually everywhere. And I walked down the road and I saw some old suitcases of hers and I saw a bust in an art gallery of her. And it became an obsession that every day I, I looked and I would find her, you know, I'd be in pizza place, she'd be watching me eat my pizza. So I thought, okay, okay, Marilyn, what is it about you? So I started collecting lots of images of her. And um, before long, you, you realize that she has this, you know, amazing sort of energy that just comes through those images and she's so despite you know the tragedy of her she's so joyful and this smile is so open um and then I was very lucky I was in LA and I was we were wandering around we went to the Beverly Hills Hotel for dinner and we were just wandering around and uh we met um this guy that worked here and we just sort of said oh you know which is Marilyn's you know bungalow because apparently she had a bungalow and he actually took us there and took us into the bungalow um, and then it turned out that someone I worked with knew this guy in, um, who lived in Jersey that had some of her dresses. Mm -hmm. He had the most amazing collection of her dresses. And in the same season, I actually went there and, you know, I, he kept them under his bed in a cardboard box. And I had the pleasure of getting like the Sun Like It Hot dress and the bus stop leotard and actually having them in my hands. And looking inside them as well. And actually I have to say the inside was the bit that I focused on because I, I know what they look like from the outside. And inside, you know, without Lycra in those days, they were just, you know, straps and little pads and buttons and all these things to kind of pull her body into shape. Um, and we used a lot of that into the, you know, into the collection. Some of the bits in the collection we kind of made inside out and we, we sort of used different techniques from those, you know, those pieces. But also she was a wonderful muse in that, you know, if we got stuck on something like, oh, what, you know, should we make this short one? Should we make it long? What color should this style be? Her voice was so sort of clear, you know, like make it shorter, sexier, tighter, <laughs> you know, pinker. So I think um, it was really enjoyable. And at the end of it, I had such a respect for her and, you know, really how very special she was. And that's why she's still hanging around. Sure. And then you make things for Dita Von Tees, who's also another amazing woman. Yeah, I uh, was so lucky to work with Dita. Um, I've been working with, I don't know how many years it is now, it might be nearly nine, ten years. Um, and we've made, the first time I met her, it was about just dressing her. She was just taking some of our dresses from the agent in LA. 
And then um, I really, really wanted to start making some of the costumes for her because it fascinates me and it became very fascinating about making something that had to come off really easily, you know, and how, you know, they're, they're quite sort of constructions and she has to be able to sort of wiggle her way out of them. And there's so many different layers and it's just fun really. And she's such a wonderful woman and she's incredibly creative. She usually comes with the initial idea and she knows the history of burlesque, you know, so well. So she always gives me lots of sort of references. Um, and it's, you know, it's a real treat actually to, to work with her. And she really is, um, when you meet her, she's as flawless as she looks, you know, yes. and she does it all herself as well, which is incredible. Amazing. Um, and the other thing is you use the word sexy. You see, most fashion designers want you to be really a, a sort of something they can put their looks on. Sexy is not usually a word they, they like, but as a woman, you think that's quite important. I think for evening wear, um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, sexy is becoming a sort of bit of an uncomfortable word, I think, somehow or other. But my customers do not want to wear loose fitting clothing. They don't want to hide their bodies. Um, and I say that, you know, if my, everybody's probably thinking, you know, because I dress models and celebrities, but we don't. We dress real women. And um, I've, I've always found what other size they are. They want to kind of, you know, really... Um, you know, look very shapely and womanly. And I think that's another reason why we've we've been in business as well for so long is that I stick to the classic shape. I don't try and hide anything, you know. Um, and yet it has to flatter, my clothes have to flatter the body, you know, and sleeves are very important, you know, neckline. And you, you try and put in a collection, into a collection, you know, dresses for lots of different body shapes. However, I, I early on, I, um, I met the designer, um, uh, Anthony Price, oh, and yeah. he said to me once um, that women either dress to get a man or keep a man. <laughs> I was horrified by this. And actually, I, I feel like I, it still actually really kind of gets me when I say it, because I think that I use the word sexy. And when you say sexy, it kind of makes you think that you're trying to appeal to men, really. But we dress, I think most of us dress for you know, ourselves, but we really dress. When I walk in a room and I feel good about myself, it's the woman in the room that I want to be looking at me. And if one of them comes over and says, oh, I love what you're wearing, that's it, I'm happy. I certainly don't dress to catch the eye of everyone, all the men in the room, that would be a nightmare situation for me. So um, I know that's not the same for everyone, but I dress woman for woman, I think. And that's why it's generally a sort of more, sort of slightly more feminine look, but I also acknowledge that, you know, generally they like to, they like to look more kind of, you know, flatter what they have rather than hide it. Sure. No, I think that's, so you make, I mean, any shape could come to you and Jenny Packham would see them right. I'm very, very proud that we dress, you know, we've dressed sort of Dakota Fanning and we've dressed Helen Mirren, we've dressed Adele, Oprah Winfrey, you know, we dress so many different types of women and I, um, I'm very proud of that fact actually. Yeah. Um, and what about uh, the idea that things should last and sustainability? Because we talked a bit about that when we had a chat. Well, I mean, I think um, there's different elements to sustainability, I think. Um, I mean, luckily, you know, bridal wear, evening wear, a lot of people keep our, keep our dresses. Sure. Um, and if they don't keep them, they're passing them down to someone else with the wedding dresses. At the same time, a lot of girls are choosing when they get married to resell their dress. So either way, actually, it's, it's more sustainable than throwing it away. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm one of those people, I think you, you should buy less, but buy you know, quality, buy something that lasts. Yeah. Um, but as a designer, I have a, I have a sort of commitment now to, to look at all the ways that we work. Fashion is a, a terrible sort of um, burden on the environment. So we have to look at everything that we do. Um, and I think it's also about changing the way that people do buy things. I think they, people have to take responsibility for that, how much they buy and how they wear it. I mean, I think a good garment, they used to say, you wear 30 to 40 times. And I'm guilty of not wearing everything 30 to 40 times. <laughs> but, you know, I think just that kind of looking after things is, is all something that we can, we can all do from, you know, to start sure. with. 
But my job is obviously going forward is to make sure that I'm sourcing closer to my factories to stop sort of so much travel of, you know, fabrics and trims, etc. Um, and to see what, you know, to, to look into the fabrics. But, you know, some of our dresses have perhaps 30 components on. So yes. it's going to take time to, you know, make sure that all of those components are, you know, not, um, not damaging in any way. But we all have to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then certain very funny things have happened in your life. I, tell us about, was it Russia that you did a, a fashion show and some of the things didn't get through? <laughs> you like the story. I um, love the story. Yeah, it was our first, our first season in uh, Moscow and um, we'd, uh, we, we have a whole sort of show kit that we send as well as obviously all the dresses. And it's always a bit nerve wracking when you put the whole collection into boxes and send it off. You know, there's hours and hours of work there. Um, but actually what happened is every time we went to Russia, one of the boxes would get, you know, stuck at customs, which usually uh, meant that someone had to go and pick it up and pay someone <laughs> to give it to them. I think it was their way of getting a little bit of extra for their Friday night drinks. But um, this time we were backstage and we didn't have any shoes. We had the dresses, we had no shoes and we, had, we didn't have our, our kit. Um, and one of the things that was in the kit was what we all call the chicken fillets which are the little kind of, you know, squidgy things that we push in our bras to push our boobs up. And um, because there was the bird flu epidemic going on, um, someone in our office had written chicken fillets onto, you know, the paperwork. And they quite rightly had stopped the chicken fillets <laughs> with the shoes coming into the country. And <laughs> so two of the translators had to go to the airport and... Um, try and explain what chicken fillets were. And when they came back, they were, they were laughing so much because they'd had to stand there in front of these customs officials sort of trying to explain, <laughs> you know, what they were. But eventually we got them. You know, we probably didn't even use them, but, you know. Um, what's interesting about all of this is it all comes from your background. A lot of this comes from your background and you do a very wonderful piece at the end of your book about your mum. And you, Two things which probably date us all is you went to a department store, how long will they be around? Mm. And you bought remnants when you were little. Tell us a bit about that. Tell us about yeah, her. The book kind of, you know, quite happened, it happened quite naturally that the, you know, it starts with inspiration and then it ends up with my my mum, which is called the after show party. Um, and uh, I think through, uh, my mum died very suddenly from a, uh, about 10 years ago with a, a aortic aneurysm um, and it was very sudden and I, I to me that chapter was always going to be about uh, the after show party as in I was going to write about sort of funereal dress and you know because it's a special occasion in a way the same as weddings and you know christenings and all the other special occasions and then when I started writing it started with I, I just it just came out that I was going to write about you know my mum her sort of passing and then a mixture of memories of being with her but also the grief and how much of my grief was tied in with her sort of clothing as well because our connection with each other as we you know grew up as I grew up was very much about clothing and you know we used to make things together and one of the stories you know quite you know once a week we would go to the local department store and look for remnants together you know which are obviously those sort of bits that don't stay on the roll anymore and um you know we would sit down and plot what we were going to make with them and you know so much of our life together was about um fashion and what we were creating we were both always creating something um so in a way it was sort of you know ending up with really you know her being the inspiration from the from the beginning um but also, yeah, there's, there's, you know, I think she was sort of, we, we would go to the Debenhams fashion shows, which would happen twice a year, big highlight for me. Um, and we would sit there and then she would whisper something in my ear, like, oh, that dress would make a good tablecloth. And <laughs> we'd laugh. And I think it was, you know, I thought it was all very glamorous. And also I, I, I enjoyed it because we would have a giggle and I'd feel, you know, a little, sort of a bond with her. And I think that's where my love of fashion, you know, probably really started. Well, the fashion show. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, not many of those, I think, in the future. No, but... Really sad. I mean, Debenhams, you know, we worked with them for 10, uh, you know, just 
about 10 years as well, which is, you know, just coming to an end. Yeah. And, you know, they were a wonderful company to work for. Um, and of course, an amazing history of 200 years. So very sad now that they, they've gone. Very but, nice. You know, we're seeing everything change very quickly. Very quickly. Well, I think that takes us in the perfect circle. I, I would like to show everybody the cover of this to show you how beautiful it will look on your bookshelves. I have loved it. Jenny, thank you very much. I think other people will have questions now, but thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Eve. Yes, we have got a couple of questions, actually. Um, uh, Miranda has asked, um, who, uh, you, you've, I don't think you really have quite said it, but uh, do you have a favorite person to dress or could you not possibly say Jenny? Well, I, I'm gonna say Dita, actually. Because, um, because she's such a creative too, it's always such a lovely collaboration. And for me, it's like, um, I think doing every now and again, you know, when I design a collection, I'm having to really think about, you know, how much it's gonna cost and, you know, the meterage and, um, you know, obviously the, the sort of the design and what can I put onto it to make it sort of um, desirable. It's very sort of, you know, there's a practical side to it, but when you do costumes, and I've been lucky to do James Bond and Harry Potter and, you know, and also Dita with a before, you know, as a performer, um, it's it takes you kind of out of, um, you know, into something new, and it's a challenge, and you can really let yourself go and go that bit further that you could than you can normally do with a, a collection, um, and you know that's that's the thing with her. You know, we can cover it in Swarovski, <laughs> um, and you know she's such a sort of gracious person as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed working with performers. You know, we worked with um, Pink, you know, lots of singers, Taylor Swift. And if they're actually going to perform in something, you have to just think about it in a very different way. So, you know, after, you know, I mean, I've been doing the collections now for so many years. So, you know, when these special projects come up, but, you know, it's something I can really enjoy. Yeah, it must be quite, quite a different process to actually produce something that somebody is going to be on stage probably dancing to maybe quite enthusiastically or not so I was just wondering how you how you sort of manage that and and, and what are there any sort of tips for well, any likely you, dressmakers you can think a lot more about durability obviously you know um if you're going to you know one of the ones we made for Taylor Swift was a sort of black dress with lots of sort of silver tassels and rather than the normal way of just sort of finishing them we, we would have to sort of put two or three threads through to make sure that they 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 wouldn't come off whilst she was, you know, swinging around. And when you do the, um, when you do things for film, they usually have, they, they don't just have one dress. I mean, you know, the Caterino Marino dress for uh, the James Bond film that we did, which laced up the back, um, you know, they, they have about 10 of those. So just in case, you know, they're gonna be filming, you know, and, and they make, make sure they've got enough just in case anything happens because, you know, maybe it does, you know, so, um, yeah, I think you just, and also you've just got to think about it being viewed a different way. You know, you've got to think about, um, uh, you know, the reflection of light on it, if they're on stage performing, how, you know, what's going to happen to the color when it's got the, you know, the lights on it. Um, so yeah, it, it just, uh, it, it's an interesting, you know, those interesting projects, good. Yeah, um, we've had uh, another one. Um, what fellow designer um, or designers do you most admire? Well, personally, I, I well, actually I have to say I admire any designer. Um, I think it's an incredibly hard business, you know, and I think people think of fashion as very kind of, you know, you know, a bit sort of, uh, I don't know, not, not such a sort of hard business, but, you know, first of all, it employs an enormous amount of people. I think it's the third biggest industry in our country. So it really matters, especially for women, you know, it predominantly employs women. Um, and then uh, I, I sort of, I can't remember the question now, you know, I, I, so I, I think that um, it's, it's a very difficult business to keep going in. I mean, I think that's why you see so many companies sort of going down um, because, you know, fashions change all the time. You have to come up with something new. So um, I really feel for all fashion designers, but personally, I absolutely love, um, I, I'm a big personal fan of Dries van Noten, actually, he's my personal 
favorite designer. I love the way he uses sort of texture and color and mm. prints. I'm a big fan of prints, even though I don't sort of wear a lot of them. Um, and then, I don't know, I, I think at the moment, I'm really fascinated with young companies who are doing fully sustainable, you know, garments. I think that's very admirable at the moment. And I think it's a great way for them to build their business in this, you know, at, at this, you know, at this point in time, because that is the future. You know, we're all within a few years really going to be analyzing what we buy. Um, and then I just, you know, I, I, I don't have particulars. I just kind of like sort of specific things from people's collection. You know, Gucci do amazing clothes and the production is beautiful. Um, Valentino is wonderful. I suppose sort of historically, I'm a big fan of sort of Dior. Um, and, you know, those, we've seen the exhibition, you know, absolutely incredible amount of work um, and uh, beauty, really, yeah. Um, another slightly tongue-in-cheek question is, have you been asked to design top halves rather than whole dresses for the awards ceremonies this year? Well, <laughs> I think that's what's happening with all of us. I mean, I, <laughs> I've got my trainers on at the moment, <laughs> but you wouldn't know. Um, and actually, when I, I, I went on Saturday to, we did a, a, a thing on Radio 4, um, the Saturday Live, and um, I realised when I got there, I'd made a terrible sort of faux pas because I looked perfectly okay down to the waist. And I honestly believed I was going to be sat behind a desk, you know, with a microphone. But actually I was sort of, they were all spaced out in the room. And I looked down and, you know, there was this enormous gap between my boots and my trousers. <laughs> and I thought, I've just got completely out of the habit of dressing <laughs> from the waist down. <laughs> it's all about this bit at the moment, you know, interesting little collars and shoulder pads or, you know, whatever we're yeah. doing, that's how we're thinking. Um, yeah. So I, I think I've just, it woke me up a bit. It was like, oh gosh, better. <laughs> well, that, that actually that leads, that leads straight on to another question. It's uh, how do you think the pandemic um, has changed the fashion industry and daily fashion? Do you think more casual and comfortable clothes will be allowed even on more formal occasions? No, we must burn them all. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to dressing properly as soon as possible. Um, no, I, I think, um, I think we don't know. I think, you know, the fashion industry is going to have changed dramatically. The high street is going to have changed. Um, and I think we are going to have changed. I just don't think we're out of it yet to see, you know, see the true picture of what's actually happened to us, you know, because it's gone on for so long now, you know, our habits have changed the way that we're, you know, if we are, I mean, you know, I was buying things online. Now I, I don't want to, I want to go into a shop and I want to see it and touch it. And I don't want to, you know, make a mistake and have to send it back. Um, but there are certain things that I will carry on, you know, with sort of online. So I think my feeling is that we won't lose that desire to go to shops. It's a social thing for us. And, you know, we, we enjoy that process as well. And I think we'll probably find a nice balance between between the two and perhaps on the high street we'll see hopefully we'll see that you know uh, landlords have to lower their rents so that they can bring in new companies and give them space to grow because I think in the fashion industry at the moment it's very hard for new companies to actually get up and running and to have you know shops because everything costs so much um, so perhaps or hopefully there might be a sort of redressing of sort of rents and cost of starting because we're going to need these sort of new businesses to come through now yeah jenny i think um you have been brilliant um all the other questions um are actually questions that eve asked um interestingly so um you you did your research brilliantly but um and most importantly jenny i just wanted to say a huge thank you to to you from all of us at the charity and from everybody who's joined today. It's been absolutely fascinating. I'm gonna hold the book up again, just to say, please, please do go and buy. It's fascinating um, as, um, as Eve and I uh, have found out. Um, you are really inspirational. I absolutely adore your designs. I wish that I could buy them every day, but sadly not. Um, but seriously, no. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, thank you very much, Eve. Um, as ever, you've done a fabulous job asking all the questions and it really has been a, a fascinating um, and wonderful um, event. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. Stay in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.